This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. PlutoSoft is a comprehensive financial planning software and CRM program. It covers every part of the advice process, fact-finding, strategy modelling, portfolio management, life insurance, SOA and report generation. Plus, it includes workflow management and a client hub portal. PlutoSoft helps financial planning firms produce high-quality advice in a fraction of the time and has an extensive range of platform data feeds. As the industry's complete all-in-one solution, PlutoSoft has helped rocket fuel the success of leading financial planning firms around Australia. This week's guest is Annie Belitho. She's an end-of-life companion and celebrant. She's also the author of Death, A Love Project. So today, of course, comes with a big fat trigger warning. We're talking about end of life, about how to have those important conversations, about what she's learned from over 20 years in this field. I learned a lot and I think you will too. Welcome, Annie. Thank you so much for being on today's podcast. Jess, it is so good to be here. I'm really happy to meet you. Enjoyed listening to a couple of your podcasts and really got a lot out of them. So great. Well, that is very exciting news, especially because you are in a different field to the one that I'm in. And that is why I've had, I had a little email pop into your inbox saying, hello, I've learned about you and I'm fascinated and I'd like you on the podcast to learn more. So without further ado, Annie, can you tell us a little bit more about your story? Sure. Look, my story is a bit sad and it's taken a long time for it to settle really. And we're talking about how end of life affects people. And it affected me really badly as a young person, like Mm. so badly. And I was going to say before, you know, one thing I realized listening to your podcast is that people in your field and my field have a lot in common. Mm. And one of the things is that we're trying to insist that people be practical. Yeah. That it's not just in the realm of maybe someday. It's like, no, now we need to be practical. Yeah. So that wasn't the case for my parents. So um, my father died without a will when I was young. Mm. My siblings and I had both had other traumatic experiences. And Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, we're young. And here's this situation that none of us are in a position to resolve, you know, searching every cupboard, looking for a will Mm. and not finding it. And then, Mm. you know, you've got to split up the assets and how you do that. And, yeah, it just left such a bad legacy. Mm. And as I mentioned, I also experienced a number of other people dying in quite traumatic circumstances around the same time. So I just came out of that just thinking no one should have to deal with this. Mm. And, you know, a lot of our society puts an emphasis on the whole feeling and emotional side of death. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's very real. It's a massive part of it. But... Equally, the practical side is really, really important. Of course. And the better that you can do the practical stuff, the easier the emotional stuff's going to be. So, you know, I know that from my experience that 
my father not having sorted that well and my mother having died earlier, mm. we were very on our own and very much spiralled into a bad emotional state for a long time. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, I just now really want to help people think about some of the things that can really help them and their families just come to a place where they know that they've just given some attention to a few things, mm. not too demanding, and that later that's just going to make such a huge difference. I mean, what you do now fascinates me, and we're going to talk about it in more detail, but it's so needed in my mind and so sad that for you it was born out of the fact that you didn't have that. And if you mm -hmm. had and, then, and had you been left in a completely different circumstance, you possibly wouldn't be doing what you're doing yeah. right now. Mm. So, and, you know, I think that's something that is true for a lot of people who work in this field. Mm. People have had experiences that they conclude shouldn't happen to others and they try their best to do it differently. So can you help our listeners understand on a practical level what it is that you do day to day? So um, I have a few things that I do and broadly mm. I kind of say I'm an educator around end of life so um, people can come to me and have a consult mm -hmm. and just talk about things. It's not an area where people find it easy to have a conversation necessarily in their family, with friends, often people kind of don't want to and just to be able to do it it doesn't need to be a therapeutic relationship it's mm -hmm. just I want to talk about this aspect of life that's very important so yeah I consult with people face to face and on online platforms some people have questions around how they're going to talk with their family, for example. Some mm -hmm. people might be thinking more about their options at end of life, um, how they want to celebrate funeral, memorial, all those kinds of things. So mm. that's very fulfilling. I help people who want to record their life stories when they've got a terminal diagnosis and that's something that again I find really wonderful work because it's not just an opportunity to leave a legacy for your family mm. but also you know here and there we might pick up the discussion of what it means to be in this circumstance at the moment I run workshops. Um, last year I did um, some work for City of Melbourne, helping people who are ageing in the City of Melbourne to stay in charge at end of life. Mm. And I'm also a funeral celebrant and help people to get the kind of arrangements they want then. It's interesting the point that you put uh, around staying in control. There was some research, and I will need to find it, around um, financial abuse affecting predominantly women and the elderly community. And it was extraordinary in terms of the number that they put on it. Um, and I can imagine that that is an extremely challenging sort of cross section of where we both meet our, our sort of um, platforms meet, which is. Oh, I think there are a lot of areas where we meet up, mm. you know, because when it comes to financial planning, there are obviously going to be long-term relationships with people. If you've got clients who um, have been doing their financial planning with you, you know, there may come a time where someone needs to be thinking more about estate planning and yeah. what will work to the best advantage of everybody. I think also, you know, some people would be wanting to think about their kids getting the kind of advice that you offer. Mm. You know, for example, in my circumstance, the estate was divided up between us. 
Mm-hmm. I wish there'd been someone like you mm. who I could have sought professional financial advice from rather than just kind of struggling around with some ideas and probably very influenced by my parents' views because I was so young. So, yeah, yeah I think there's heaps of crossovers. I completely agree. Now, one thing you left out, which I'm like, I would love to touch on, because I I know about you because we have a mutual connection. And when she told me this, I was so fascinated, which is what got me Googling and learning more about you. Can you please talk about the death cafes? Uh, so, look, you've mentioned and everyone who works around end of life, for example, in palliative care, in um residential aged care, everyone's kind of interested in how to promote conversations about death because mm. I think they all recognise that if people talked about it more when they were well and happy and able, it'd be so much easier down the track. So at this time, there are a lot of initiatives trying to increase what's broadly called death literacy. Mm-hmm. And for example, um, palliative care in Victoria provides cards that are kind of conversation starters. And there's an initiative called Death Dinner Party in the US that's been taken up in Australia as well. There's an organization called Groundswell, which is probably one of the main advocacy organizations in Australia for death literacy. They do a workshop called 10 Things to Know Before You Go. And Death Cafe is probably one of the most successful amongst all these initiatives. And perhaps the reason why is that it's got a very open agenda. It doesn't kind of have any um, sort of menu that it lays on people. Mm -hmm. Anyone who comes to a death cafe can um, simply join a conversation with strangers because they want to talk about it and the conversation's completely open. So I've always enjoyed doing them because I'm a professional facilitator, so that makes it easier for me to help people to have fulfilling conversations and to warm up to each other around this really difficult topic. And do you find most of the people that would go to the death cafes or join the death cafes are there because they are having to have end-of-life conversations either because they have have become sick and aware of their mortality because they're getting older, because someone in their family or someone close to them has been diagnosed or passed away recently? Are there common themes or are people just happy to go to this because it's an area where it is taboo and they want to lean in and learn more? Look, I think there's very diverse reasons people attend and you'd be surprised how many people just have a basic curiosity Mm. to talk about death and they just find there's nowhere that they can talk about it. So that's a certain cohort, often people who are between like 18 and 35. And for some of those people, it can be quite a passion, you know, that they're doing a lot of internet searching and just generally informing themselves on a topic they think is important but no one wants to talk about. Then there are those people who perhaps had someone die a few years ago and they find it easier to talk about people who want to talk about death than perhaps to introduce the conversation with people who are a little bit uncomfortable that maybe they're too sad or to in need of help or something. They just want to talk about the person and how it was. Mm. And, you know, sometimes people come because they've had an experience that's been quite um, demanding on them. Mm. Very various reasons. Um, One time I had a minister who just obviously sees a lot of people in the course of her work and 
She just wanted to come into a conversation like that. And why are we, I mean, this is such a big question, please solve this huge societal problem. <laughs> Andy, no pressure. But I, I am fascinated in an expert opinion. You know, why do you think now, after everything that we've been through, why are we still so extremely uncomfortable talking about this topic? Well, I think firstly it's human. Mm -hmm. In general, we kind of prefer beginnings to endings. Mm. You know, they're more exciting. They've got promise. We haven't explored, you know. It's like I was at a christening yesterday and honestly, those babies, there were three families and each baby was just a world of possibility. Mm. You know, whereas endings have a lot more demands on them often, even if you're just finishing a project. Lots of people just can't bear the wrap up. <laughs> and I think the same goes for end of life. You know, it's this more demand, um, you know, often people are very vulnerable, relationships are sensitive, and, of course, the fact that nobody's thought about it often makes it a really difficult, um, or I don't know often, but it can make it a difficult experience. So I think the reluctance has a kind of basic human dimension, and I think that's obviously compounded in our society by the fact that we're very youth-focused, we place incredible amount of faith in medical technology and we want our medical technology to keep people alive. And that's a dilemma for clinicians as well. How did they talk about death? I don't think that comes easily to many clinicians. So mm. it's, yeah, it adds up to quite a... Um, closed shop, doesn't it? And it really sets us all up for really sad, emotional, uh, I mean, it would be sad and it's sad and emotional anyway, but I feel that the inability to talk about something that is inevitable for everyone around us, it's so unhelpful, Annie, it's so well, unhelpful. There are two more reasons why we don't talk about death. Tell me, I need all of them, please. <laughs> I think um, one very big reason is that we're very dualistic and I think that's particularly um, a Western first world thing, good, bad, success, failure, life, death. It's kind of like they put it to poles, whereas in fact nobody is actually dead until they're dead. People are alive the whole time. So um, I think that's one really important thing to have in mind, that even if someone's very ill, it's life. And to try and always frame things around death in the context of life. So a friend of mine who needs some help contacted me recently and the subject line in the email is death your favorite thing <laughs> <laughs> anyway I got back to her and I said can I just clarify life is my favorite thing and death is part of that you know it's like so I think that kind of um aspects another reason why it's hard for us to um be effective in the space. The other thing is, and perhaps that is because we put so much emphasis on emotion and getting it right emotionally and feeling good, and we often want to have one interaction bring everything together. Mm. We want to have one perfect, successful interaction that solves this sadness that you're feeling because of your circumstance. Or we want to be able to talk to parents and say, 
there's this thing coming up and we need to talk about it, but it has to all happen in this neat little package. And that's not how we communicate about other things. We communicate in little steps. Mm. And we kind of gradually get to a point where we can talk a bit more. So I really encourage people not to be thinking in this kind of um, one big conversation way. Mm. Much more like just touch in on it lightly. You know, I saw this movie and this happened. And it really made me think of blah. That's all you need to say. I'm having a brain explosion. <laughs> and then, you know, you might say, remember a couple of months ago we were talking about that movie I saw? Yeah, I subsequently I've been thinking, what about you? Mm. And then, you know, a bit further down, maybe that person's going to say to you, I saw a movie and I'm thinking. It's a much more um, gentle dialogue than here I come with the right way to talk to you about this. That is such a powerful point because I think that as financial advisors, what we say to people in terms of how to do this, and it's okay if you've done this before, um, it almost becomes this really formal, really stuffy, getting everyone together around a round mm. table. You know, there's this weird vibe and it's almost this, um, you know, uh, pre thought through agenda or you have, mm. you know, the lawyer in and it becomes very serious, very fast. And that is very confronting for a lot of people mm. and too much mm. too fast. And I think you're a hundred percent right. And I'm giggling because I am always reflecting on what do I do and how have I done this? And I think you'll appreciate this small story. Um, many years ago, I became an organ donor. I don't know whether you have to opt out, but back then you had to opt in. And yeah. so I sent my good friends and my family a text and I said, hello, this is just a small message in case anything bad happens to me while I'm still okay. I want you to know that I want my organs to be donated. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting this out as a group text because I won't, I don't want anyone to fight with each other. This is what I want. Anyway, one of my beautiful girlfriends who is the executive of my will, she wrote back within 10 seconds and she wrote, I bags your bum. And it was just this brilliant way to that started this great group chat um about organ donation which she completely lightened the mood and you know mm. took the heat out of what can be a really sort of difficult conversation and just i think about you know this is more than 10 years ago i think about it now and i giggle and mm. it's exactly what you're saying sort of just adding those layers to the conversations that get built over time and you know at the same time in your field there's a great pressure on time. People are really needing to be effective in how they manage their time and make um, hmm. their work flow, you know, and sometimes introducing this topic, you know, in a way it's easier to go, okay, we'll have a formal meeting. It'll take so much time and then it'll be done, you know. But, of course, I think, one of your previous guests talked about how there are people in your field who are in it for relationships and a whole lot of things that aren't just making a fortune. Mm. And, you know, if your values are such that you really do want to help people have their full lives to the maximum, I think it's wonderful if you can take a more layered approach just by introducing a topic and then a bit later on a bit more and then doing a more formal kind of meeting. Mm, it's a great suggestion. About humour, oh, there just can't be enough of it really. Completely agree. She'll be happy to, happy to hear that I've put that. My, by the way, I, I recognise that that part of the body is not one that gets donated and she does too, but it was just such a good story. I couldn't not put it in. <laughs> so 
I'm interested in understanding, you know, someone who really specializes in this space and, and knowing that you've done this born out of a really sad set of circumstances, how has this, has this area of expertise help you live differently? And if so, how? Well, look, I'm just going to read to you out of my book because I have a little bit which says, in the face of the reality of death and loss, life feels precious and rich. Being in touch with the finite nature of life creates a sense of opportunity, even though it is very sad. Knowing about different approaches to death and having conversations ahead of time can make a real difference. And so I think I certainly feel my life's very enriched by having the privilege of being in contact with people who have had really unfortunate diagnoses and are kind of gradually working through that as time goes on. And yeah, I really love the fact that I am able to make a small difference. And obviously, it's something where you wouldn't want to make anything more than a small difference because people are doing that journey themselves. We can only do that journey ourselves. Um, mm. So it's just that thing of if I'm able to touch in in some way, even like in this conversation with you, Jess. Mm. It's just lovely to know I can make a small difference. I'm going to go off script here because I sent you a few questions, but <laughs> if you've listened to my podcasts, you know that they go anywhere. Given that we're talking about some of the more practical components to death, do you have any thoughts or ideas on what could be helpful things to say? Uh, I'll tell you why I'm asking this. We talked about this before we started today's conversation. My father passed away when I was very little and I'm very comfortable talking about it and its impact that it's had on me and my family, but I don't bring it up very much because it makes all the rest of the people around me really uncomfortable. And one of the things that they will, people will often say to me when they learn about it is, I'm sorry. And I have caught myself saying I'm sorry as well, despite the fact that um, when people say it to me, I find it quite odd because I know that they had nothing to do with it, but I understand their intention is to say, I mm. feel for you or what, whatever. But mm. are there better things that we could be saying to someone who discloses to us that they've been diagnosed with something or if a, a partner or a close person in someone's life has passed away, what are some things that you think we should be thinking about saying? Mm. Look, it's interesting that you say that people respond to you that way, even though your father passed away a very long time ago and mm. you've led your whole life. I suppose in a way it's a bit of a um, spontaneous reaction to say I'm sorry. Mm. But, you know, at the same time, like you say, I think that does come from a well-intentioned place and – just responding, thanks, thank you, is quite enough. Mm. <laughs> but look, I think people are so, so different mm. in how they respond to, you know, what can be a welcome embrace through talking mm. or can equally be a really unwelcome intrusion. So, you know, I think, it's something where it is worth kind of stepping back and bearing in mind who the person is, how they normally react, and not going in there with a formula. Mm. So, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that people's discomfort is often because they don't know what's going to come next. Mm. And... I think if you are going to talk to someone, make sure that the context is a good context. You know, don't do it in a workplace setting where the person's got to make some decisions in the next half hour or something. 
that's the wrong context to be talking to a person who's um, had something happen. And if you start a conversation, be willing to just be there to listen. And I think people can pick that up very quickly if you're just kind of coming in with um, something that feels like a good thing to say or whether you're actually there with them and you're going to wait and see how they respond. And I suppose that's one thing I would definitely say, and we see it in death cafes, I see it all the time, that people are so uncomfortable with silence. It's so much easier to just rush on because you don't know what's coming next. Mm. But if you can actually just wait, that can be so helpful because you can just settle into yourself and be in a better space to listen to whatever it is that person might say. Hmm. You're so right. And it's so hard because you want mm. to take the uncomfortableness away and yeah. you think by mm. talking it will fix all of the things. And, of course, in fact, it doesn't. And, you know, that kind of silence actually does require practice. Mm. Maybe that's one of the really good things about death cafes, that people get the opportunity to sit in silence and just be together knowing that shit happens. Mm. And we can all practice it all the time, just, you know, when we're ready to rush on because we feel uncomfortable, just taking a step back instead. Yeah, I think that's a good lesson, particularly, I think, in a society that has this toxic positivity, you know, everything has a silver lining, everything's going to be okay. You can hustle your way out of every problem. It's like, no, actually some things are really awful and some things are really sad and it's okay to not be okay. And we also need to be louder about that for helping people sit with whatever they've got going on and not try to pull them out of something. Yes, and perhaps, you know, being willing for that to actually hang around for quite a while. Mm. So a woman who has been a great ally of mine um, has recently um, put out on social media how significant her illness is mm -hmm. and um Many of us probably didn't even know that she was ill. Right. And honestly, just to see people's responses on the Instagram thread was fascinating in itself. And I noticed that the whole weekend I've just had this woman on my mind. I just feel so sad mm. and so much like I would love to do something, but there's nothing that I can do other than some advocacy. So, yeah, I think that willingness to let other people's difficult experiences affect one and, you know, be part of one's mood for a weekend is probably something we don't do enough of. And I think, you know, even the fact that that person has touched you so that you felt like that is legacy and is really beautiful in a weird odd way it's a really lovely thing that that person is cared about by that community and yeah I, th I think we just for me personally I know that I can do a better job in getting out of the um, I grew up in a in a um, in a house where we we were very silver lining -y, and it it's very um, good to a point, and then it's very mm. destructive beyond that. <laughs> um, interesting. So mm. I would love to know, given that you speak to people at a, at this point in their life, are there often things that people will say to you that they regretted or choices that they didn't make that they wish they had? You know, are there any learnings or similar themes that people talk to you about in terms of mistakes or missed opportunities? No, very rarely. I mm. think because what I offer is kind of a bit left field, 
it's not therapeutic mm. and it's also for people who really want to take charge of their circumstances. They're often people who have taken charge in the past as well. Mm. And rather than talking about missed opportunities, I think a lot of people want to express their gratitude and be very, very involved with the wonderful life that they've had. So I think that makes my work even more um, enriching, that I can know that if I join those people in not complaining, not kind of begging someone somewhere to help me through, but just being with how life is at the moment, hopefully when I come to the point that they're at, I'll also be able to demonstrate that level of life. Mm, that is fascinating. You know, I feel like I'm learning and leaning into a lot of my own personal stories, but um, I went to a funeral a little while ago, a family member's funeral, and the family member was extremely religious. And I remember walking out of the funeral and thinking, that could have just been a mass. It really didn't have anything beyond a few moments of personalization. It really felt to me like a mass. And I was so sad for the missed opportunity of what it could have been in terms of the celebration of the uniqueness of that person. And not to say that religion can't form and shouldn't form a part of that. Obviously, everyone's got their own beliefs. But I'm sure I was sad about the funeral, but I was more sad. And actually, I then became quite grumpy <laughs> because I thought mm. there's very few opportunities for us to really pause and reflect and celebrate all of the beauty that is that person or was that person. And mm. it made me really reflect on my own. So I'm 34 mm. and I've pretty well planned my funeral. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> And just very loudly, in case my will goes missing, the cheapest coffin there ever was and the most expensive catering, and I want everyone to have a really bloody great time. <laughs> you see, everyone knows now worldwide what you want. <laughs> <laughs> but it did, it, did, it did make me really think, gosh, if I have to leave this to other people who are not in a good headspace, that's really a big overwhelming mm. and there's mm. a time often f for situations that are unplanned you know when it's not a long process there's a time thing at play as well it i think there's a time thing at play throughout everything we're talking about is a time thing and that time thing is your life and really you can say that these are things that can wait or You'll think about them sometime. And look, if you are someone who's a person of faith with a strong relationship with the church, obviously they take care of things from start to finish and it'll be very traditional and there won't be some opportunities, but there'll be others. However, nowadays it's just such a world of choice and really you may as well choose your funeral as well you choose your computers anything that's got a comparable price tag on it you make a choice you don't just say oh, i'll have that because someone's offering it to me you just do a few costings ahead of it it's true so um can we talk about some of the things that you've seen that are unusual but perhaps just because people haven't thought about them and perhaps would think oh that's a brilliant idea so i said i'm a funeral celebrant and organize funerals and one of the areas i specialize in is helping with funerals where there are young children involved mm. and for me that's mainly been people where a grandparent has died. Okay. Because nowadays that's a very common thing that grandparent-grandchildren relationships are very close and it's huge when a grandparent dies. Mm. And 
during lockdown, I did a funeral for a family and this girl of like 12 years old gave a really powerful little eulogy. Oh. And most people would just go, what? They wouldn't have the confidence. You couldn't ask a kid to do that. They'll be too upset. But she really, really took that role. And that was because I led her to understand that she'd do it well and that people would appreciate it and that her grandma would. And, you know, one of the things we did it was a funeral where they had the coffin there and in the early part of the funeral, people were having a look at this woman and just saying goodbye. And we spent some time with her grandma together and chatted about it afterwards. And I just thought, what a gift, you know. This girl is going to be so well set up. So Mm. that's an area where I like to realize the most potential possible because I think if you have good experiences when you're young, you're not going to have problems later. Some things people do, people do the most amazing stuff, you know. One woman, very family-oriented, learned that it's possible to do um, carbon um, investments because obviously if you're cremated, there's a very high um, carbon cost. And so there are ways obviously to offset that. And I talk about that in my book. You can, people buy carbon offsets all the time in their businesses Mm. and in their personal lives anyway, you hardly have to buy any carbon to offset a funeral. You just go to a company that does that, pay out a thousand bucks and you've offset that. Anyway, she was more interested in scale and she and her family organized with the company to plant like I don't know, like 300 trees or something like that. Wow. So all these carbon offset companies have places where trees are going in. They took a space there. They all went out as a family and they just planted so many trees. Wow. And that was kind of like their day with their mum. I thought that was fabulous. It is fabulous. So fabulous. I'm going to read your book. I'm ashamed to tell you that I haven't read your book, but I have only learned about you very recently, so I'm using that as my excuse. Um, But I did read, and I don't know whether you'll like or hate this, but I read On Death and Dying a few years ago by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A mentor suggested that I read it because he said, the day is coming where you need to Mm -hmm. have this chat. And I am extremely grateful that he told me to read it because it did, it was fascinating and confronting at the same time, but I'm adding your book to my list. So just on that, Mm. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had four stages of grieving. And in more recent times, people have kind of felt that four is a bit limited, Mm. that it closes a package and that that package actually is forever really open. And so when I titled my book Death, A Love Project, the idea of the love project is that fifth stage where you never let go of the person. Mm -hmm. You just keep doing stuff that Mm -hmm. keeps them alive in the most positive way that nurtures you, you know, if that person loved stars, you can keep on making stars your thing Hmm. for all the years to come and invoking that person. And I think that's something we don't think about enough. If we thought about that fifth stage more, about how we live when someone who's really important to us has died, it's very helpful. There's a great book that I'm recommending to you now. It's on my Instagram feed. 
and it's what to do when I'm gone. Oh, I saw and this it, on your Instagram. Yes. It's a mother and daughter. And basically this mother who's still alive is telling her daughter what to do from day one to like day a thousand, you know, like day seven, bury me, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, if you're ever having a bad day, look in the mirror. Remember how I saw you. Mm. You are beautiful. You know, those kind of things. We need to be thinking of that journey because handling that journey, knowing we'll handle that journey, certainly will make it easier to contemplate that that journey is inevitable. Annie, I could talk to you about this for many more hours, but I'm cognizant of the time. Because I think this needs to be the start of a conversation, how can people go and learn more about you, your Instagram, your book? How can people best find you? So I'm on Instagram under my name mm -hmm. and I've got a website, Annie Belitho, which comes up at the top of the Google search and Look, I think that's enough, but I really would encourage people to buy my book. It's been read by nearly a thousand people and the majority of them get back to me and just say it was helpful. Yeah. And it can help you if you're just a bit nervous or if you're actually looking at a circumstance that's arising, just have a little read of it. Make death a love project rather than a fear subject. Mm. I think we can all benefit from reading something that helps us normalize this very important topic. Now, before we round out today's conversation, I sent you a few rapid fire questions. Are you okay to cover them? <laughs> Let's do it. So my question to you firstly is, especially given all of the things we've been talking about today, what do you do to look after your mental health? I speak to people who are like you, warm, mm. excited by life and looking to the future. Thank you. That's a lovely response. Is there a piece of advice that you would have given your younger self? Oh, man, it's okay. You're doing your best. Oh, it's beautiful. Do you have anything that's big that is on your bucket list look i thought i'd like to travel again that's all i want to do i just <laughs> want to get on a plane and i'm going to singapore oh i'm nice. dealing with my bucket list immediately lovely and do you like that i talk about bucket lists every week because i like to talk about making sure people do the big things that are important to them while they're still enjoy, able to enjoy enjoy yes <laughs> now I'd imagine that the book for my fake book club is your book. It is. Wonderful. I am adding that on there. I have literally written that down. Annie, thank you so much for being this week's podcast guest. I have been challenged and really buoyed by the important conversations that you're having. So a huge, huge thank you from the XY community. Jess, I've loved talking to you and I was quite honest when I said talking with someone like you is great for my mental health. Oh, thank you, Annie.